All right, we'll start. Um, so I wasn't in church this morning, but I appreciated watching everybody. And um, I'm going to just start off with saying something totally not related. Um, I was always a hater of the extended greeting time, watching everybody. And over the last month or two, I have come to love it. I have talked to people that I haven't talked to. Um, so, yeah, I love that I could watch um, the service on TV today, but um, but but I watched it and I was like, look at those two just chatting away. I thought that was so wonderful and it's better um, than a handshake or anything because now you do that and you have to say, how are you? And you have to say, what you know, like, what have you been up to or how your week was? So I just wanted to tell you guys that I changed my view. I'm now a, yes. Well extended greeting love it only took a year um, it only took a year which is yeah. way quicker than most things mm -hmm. i change over to um and then Still i working on communion by the way yeah <laughs> um so uh in uh, micah's church this morning which was christ church of oakbrook in lombard um the point of his sermon um was jesus did not come to earth to be our life coach he came to be our savior. And, um, and that has resonated with me all day. And then watching your sermon or listening to your sermon, um, baptism and um, John the Baptist, prepare the way, get ready. God didn't come to just tell us what it's like to be a good person. He came to be the savior, repent and do that. And so for, for me, I was double blessed because that sermon and then, the segue into yours. So, um, so yeah, that's that's how I'd like to start it um, a little bit because my first note is repent, prepare the way, get ready. A, a little bit on that topic, could you clarify? I think you said it this morning that baptism was uh, common at that time before John the Baptist. Could you say just a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, so there were two kinds of washings and there was a a more ceremonial washing for jewish people they wouldn't have called it baptism but it's washing in the mikvah before going into synagogue and, and even like the pool of siloam on the way into the temple there was a sort of ritual cleansing again it would not have been called baptism baptism was reserved for gentiles who were converting to judaism and one of the steps, and, you know, sometimes in scripture, they're called God fearers and they're sort of close to people think Cornelius in the book of Acts, um, who's a God fearer and supports the synagogue. Um, but that you could take these steps towards for a male, often that step included circumcision. Um, but if you were to go all the way in, so not be a, a God fearer, but go all the way in, one of the final steps would be baptism. So going to be baptized for, for forgiveness of sins, it was not a, a thing Jews did themselves. It was for other people. And that's what kind of ties to, I, I never kind of made that connection to what John is saying here. But when John says, you know, you call yourself children of Abraham, well, the stones could be children of Abraham. Um, you're, you're a brood of vipers. You're children of snakes. And instead, you need, to, you need the same thing that the Gentiles need. You need to repent, be baptized, come back into God's covenant family. When did it switch over? And I realized this wasn't about your sermon, but but I did put a little dash there because um, that's not baptism yeah. today. You preached a great sermon on that, you know, a while ago. Yeah. So several several things. It's, it began to switch through, I mean, through John the Baptist. So Acts 19, uh, is it 19? I have it in my notes, but um, is it in Ephesus that uh, Paul goes and says, what baptism did you have? Oh, John's baptism. He says, we now receive Jesus' baptism, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Um, or the, um, the jailer, uh, is it in Philippi where... Um, Paul, they, you know, what, what do we need to do? Well, you be repent and all your whole family be baptized. And so it, with Christianity, then it became sort of an entrance into the uh, covenant family. 
and uh, more along the lines of what it was for Gentiles, but now for everybody. And then how did it come to infant? Um, that would be within the next several uh, centuries, it began to be practiced for, again, the covenant children of believers and um, recognizing that it, it kind of took the place of circumcision, essentially, that this would be the mark of God's covenant there. Now, and that, that you know, up through till the Reformation and then the Anabaptist movement sort of separated it out and had believer baptism again. Uh, but for, call it a thousand years or so, it was, um, baptism was for your interest into the covenant community, typically at, at when you're an infant. So the, the Jews in general, me. go ahead, Dave. The Jews in general just did not like the Gentiles. So to accept that they were com comparable to the Gentiles would have had a would have been a, a pretty remarkable reduction in the way they looked at themselves, right? Yeah, I mean, I th I think it's really again it's remarkable just how the people responded to John the Baptist. Um, that not only I mean, so it'd be one thing for someone to be saying, hey, you need to repent and people actually doing it. But then to say you need to repent and actually come back to faith as a Gentile would, that's a huge thing. And that the crowds were going out to him. Um, and, you know, it not in uh, Luke, but I, I think it's in uh, Matthew that the Pharisees and Sadducees are out there. And um, they're the ones that he calls the brood of vipers. So, yeah, the Obviously, God was doing something that kind of preparing this revival that people would respond in such a way and um, receive that correction from John. But you called it revolutionary and um, said the people need to clean up their act. Yeah. Um, the Jews even would have known about repentance. I mean, they did sacrifices all the time. Mm -hmm. And then. And, and with acts of repentance. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I wonder if they would have. So, you know, they did do sacrifices. Uh, so repentance, there are a couple of words. Um, metamelomai, I've talked about this before, um, essentially means to feel guilty for what you've done. And metanoia, noia is mind um and it's change change your mind change change the way you act and i i think even like yom kippur and the other the day of atonement there would be a guilt for what i've done and a sacrifice but that that wouldn't be true repentance repentance would say and now you know jesus says now go um and do live differently go and do likewise or um go and, and change the way you live and so i think that they they maybe would have had a, an idea of, yeah, we need to be forgiven for our sins, but um, we can just go do it again and then be forgiven again. I mean, sometimes we as Christians get the same idea. But. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I was thinking. So what did what did it mean for them to clean up their act meant to not only repent, feel sorry for what you did, offer a sacrifice, and by sacrifice, it has to be something you're sacrificing, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, but they ha there has to be change. So it has yeah. to be like, I th and that's what John the Baptist was introducing was the third part of all this. I think so, yeah. And, and really, in, um, I mean, he's in the, he's in the pattern of the prophets who did this too. And this, this is a big part of the first part of Isaiah is, um, you know, God says, I don't, I don't like your religious festivals. All these things you're doing, I don't care about that. But care for the poor and care for the people around you. And so John is sort of entering into that stream of prophetic witness. And maybe if people recognize, they they recognize that. That, oh yeah, we have these prophets from, particularly right before um, the exile, that were really prophesying in this way. So I think Isaiah would have, it would have been a different word in Hebrew, but would have been calling to a, a kind of repentance too. Um, Amos, definitely. Micah, you know, Micah 6, 8, what does God require but to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? Uh, was kind of act, calling that too. 
All of the examples, though, that are given in this scripture are about people to their fellow man, not to not to a spiritual one, to, to the Lord. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, what should we do? Well, you should, uh, you know, the man with two tunics should share with us who, want, who has one. You should not exhort. It's all about how you treat your fellow man. It would have seemed that it would have, there would have been a spiritual dimension saying you should love love your God, you should pray to him, and, and, and that I don't even see that in here. So is it a different type of a call? Um, yeah. so, so that's partly Luke. Um, and, and Luke is the one who has those examples. So can I say, you know, social justice folks, this is where they find it, right? Dorothy Day says, if you have two coats who stole one from the poor, she's basically echoing John the Baptist in saying that. Um, and so that that is an emphasis, particularly of Luke. I'm just going back to um, Matthew, but he, he you know, does the whole brood of vipers thing John the Baptist does, um, but he he does not have any any um, people confess their sins. He has uh, um, repentance too, but doesn't have the very practical steps that Luke does. So that again, I would say a particular em em uh, emphasis of Luke. So yeah, I mean, some of that is, um, you know, Paul says, you, you say you love God, well, show, show with your deeds, um, not with your words. And that's a bit of what John is saying there, too. Where is it in Matthew, by the way? Oh, I just had it, but uh, it's Matthew th 3. Okay. Yeah, Matthew 3, 1 through um, 12. A, a lot of very similar words. Um you know, there's winnowing fork is in his hands, brood of vipers. It's the brood of vipers part is in all three or all four gospels, actually. Um, yeah, so there, there's some, and they all of them sort of quote Isaiah. It's interesting, again, Luke is a little different than others. I didn't really have a chance to focus on it um, this morning, but Luke includes verse six. So, you know, all of them have prepared the way of the Lord, make straight paths. All this, but Luke has, um, and all people will see God's salvation, which, which comes from Isaiah 40. And so there is a, um, Luke is both more strict on people, but also a little bit more hopeful that, and this will come for all, all people. Yeah. Okay. You're back, Kyle. Yeah. Good. So I said Matthew three. Probably heard that part, and then I don't know if you heard the rest of it. A little bit, only a little bit after that. Yeah. So I was just saying, um, Luke in chapter verse six continues the quote from Isaiah, um, where it says, "And all people will see God's salvation," and that's unique to Luke. Neither of the other gospels. I mean, it's in Isaiah, uh, but neither of those Gospels hold that part, too, which is an interesting sort of gracious extension um, that Luke has that Matthew, Mark, um, and, and even John don't have. And that's pretty, that's really significant, then, because there he is including the Gentiles right there and there, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, again, I, I didn't have time or focus on it, but to really compare what John is doing to what Isaiah is doing in Isaiah 40. Um, because this, you know, I talk all the time from Isaiah. There's the, the split is at verse chapter 39. And to 40 is actually either in exile or to people who have returned from exile. And it starts, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. And so, um, you know, this is God making a way for people who have been cast out and uh, now will be coming back. And uh, so Luke, or, you know, John the Baptist, I don't know if he's referencing that comfort, but it's not giving very comforting words when he comes and calls him a brood of, brood of vipers and such. He said, don't try and overthrow, but live with integrity. Overthrow. I'm, um, 
Uh, you know, we don't have to like what's going on, but not try and overthrow something, but work within it. Right? Is I mean, living with integrity doesn't seem like that's just enough. Yeah, and I think to be clear, this is John's word to these folks. Um, I think I haven't seen the Bonhoeffer movie, but you know, in that situation, was it right of him to try to overflow throw Hitler? One thinks probably right, like, um, and so uh, it's not always or Romans thirteen, you know, respect the government and all this. Um, that's not always the the thing that we uh, have to do, but. I think in this case, John says, again, to the tax collectors, um, you know, don't live within the system. Don't try to overthrow it. I don't think it's a, a universal word for everybody. It was a word for them at that time. OK. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but yeah. think about the civil rights movement. Answer... Well, I'm just all of a sudden trying to apply that to the civil rights movement, like um, how they did civil disobedience, but they did it like they took the burden on themselves, right? Like they didn't, they didn't try to overthrow with power. They, they just try to show the incivility of um, our society through. And so I think even they would have done that in ways that are consistent with Romans 13 or, um, or Luke three, but um, did bring about a big change. Going to the first part, all the people we could blame, but really it is us. Ugh, I, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, Dave and I were talking, you know, once you start digging at that list, you're like, oh, man, you, there's all kinds of people to blame in those first couple verses. And even I hadn't sorted through the, the Tetrarch thing that there are four of them. And it really goes from north to south and then. And at the most important position is is held by a Roman person. Um, yeah, I, John would have had plenty of material if he wanted to look outward, but he doesn't. Yeah, I thank you for putting that introduction there. That was very meaningful. We're trying to think of why these people would go out in the desert. It seems like a, a sort of an unusual act. Uh, but there's another hint, and that is uh, in verse 15, the people were waiting expectantly and were wondering in their hearts if the John might possibly be, in this version I have, the Christ. The, some say the Messiah, right? Yeah. Um, so they were looking for this Messiah. So they must have sensed enough similarities to what the prophets had said that this guy had the makings of a possible Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they were always trying to categorize. So, you know, Jesus asks, who, who do people say that I am? And they would say, well, Elijah, one of the prophets, some say John the Baptist, um, some say the Messiah. So they, you know, they were trying to put him into a category for sure he was a prophet, but was he the um, the anointed one? I was thinking for the lessons of carols, I might do a little reflection on John's clothing. It's not in Luke, but um, just even in, uh, it's in Matthew that he, the camel's hair and he eats honey and looks like he, he stylized himself as a prophet. And so that he was giving them clues to, to who he was just by how he was dressing and, and acting. So did the other, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and the other older prophets, did they dress like that too? Um, yeah, so I, Isaiah, I think, and actually um, the camel's hair, it's Elijah, is meant to reference, I believe. Uh, Jeremiah at some point was naked at the gate, so we don't want to follow what he does. But um, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, I think it was actually more Elijah that it was patterned after. Than Isaiah or Jeremiah. No. Sherry, you got the questions? Yeah. Uh, hold on a minute. I have to find them back. I did have the question. Oh, here they are. How do you prepare for a visit to your home? 
<laughs> really, you really nailed that one. We had everyone here yesterday, Saturday for Thanksgiving, and believe me, the previous days before that, there was a lot of work going on here. It was a, somewhat of a hostile environment. <laughs> <laughs> out all the dirt did you get stuck in the dirt <laughs> i know you're pain dave she does not <laughs> oh, <you're pain>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. arm, hurt arm i'll just sit on the couch yes yeah. <laughs> it works yeah i don't yeah. i never want anything on the counters i don't want anything setting around and so is that she puts things not... away in a very secret place <laughs> can't find them yeah. yeah. Well, I kind of had to clean twice because I had people on Thursday and yesterday. So um, kind of didn't do deep cleaning between, you know, on Friday because there was going to be more kids yesterday than there were on Thursday. So I thought, you know, they're not going to care if it's super clean or not. They were just making more of a mess anyway. I think there is a connection though what we tolerate in our homes and what we tolerate in our hearts or what we like there's stuff that we just yeah if it's just going to be me then I'll walk around it or whatever yeah but if I knew someone was going to come over and I think again like there's parts of our lives that we probably just walk around rather than address and so yeah well, and I think, I think, oh, I should be more like Mary Seitzma that just come in. You're part of the family. Come in. It doesn't matter. And then it's, no, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, yeah, me, the other daughter in law. Oh, it's been rough. <laughs> it's too bad Mary's not here because I guess we could all say, Mary, you kind of ruined it for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Ruined it for yeah. But that's how. People really feel welcome is because yeah. it's come in. This is my life. Come right in. She does a great job. She yeah. and Dan do a great job. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Unfortunately, they... I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's really great, especially since I know this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I 100% agree. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> So I don't know why I have that strong drive that everything has to be really, really clean and orderly and put together. So that I don't want people to know what I'm really like. Or Although I don't really, I really want it to be clean all the time. So it's probably how you were, uh, how you grew up. What was the situation yeah. that you were taught when you were young? I mean, in our house, we had seven kids, a hired man. The house, we, you know, it would, it would not be cleaned up. And my mom was just fine with that. So I have a different standard than Mary, whose parents were really, or whose mom was really strict about everything's got to look right. Yeah, I grew up with that, too. Everything needed to look right. And, um, and, and I remember at one point saying to my mom, you know, you are welcome to come over anytime as much as you want, but I cannot handle the pressure of having everything look good. I got four kids and I lived in a tiny house. And my mom was like, I am so sorry. I didn't realize I was putting that pressure on you. I didn't realize it. Never said a word again. It was like, yep. Yeah. She just would move the junk off the couch and happy as could be. So you know, sometimes it's self-imposed pressure, or sometimes you just need to say something. Yeah. How about you, Dan? Well, when I was growing up, it wasn't, we didn't have a whole lot to like, make sure things are tidy. You know, everybody's house was pretty super simple, but ever since we've been here, we're definitely way more conscious about how things look like, because we have more and just more things laying around. Um, and I think, yeah, you want to respect the company. So you you clean up as as much as possible. And usually for me, it's, yeah, just chucking everything into a closet sometimes. <laughs> it's going to be messy again, but yeah. 
So Christians are accused of that in another way, too. On Sunday, we go to church and we have our best clothes on and we all act very nicely when people can see us. But then when we go home, we're the same people that we were before. So that's that's not a nice accusation either. But it might there might be some truth to it. Like I'll do laundry on Sunday, but I won't mow the lawn so the neighbors don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think the point is, how are we preparing for Advent and um, maybe adding something to our routine, maybe changing something in our routine? Maybe how are we preparing for that day as opposed to me cleaning for all the kids coming? How am I preparing? Yeah. How does it make a difference to remember that he is coming? I think, again, if we if, we, if the guest isn't coming, then you just tolerate. But if you say, oh, no, he's on his way, um, I think we mm -hmm. have a little more urgency. And that's what John the Baptist was trying to do. Mm -hmm. But he literally was doing it. We're just symbolically. Which, yeah. So oh, so you almost have to be more intentional, right? Yeah. But, I mean, we're literally too. But he just knew it was like imminent. And we don't know that it's imminent. Or, I mean, Jesus said... It is, but we've been waiting 2,000 years, so we kind of let down our guard. Yeah. What's the next question, Cherry? What might John the Baptist tell you to do in preparation for Christ's return? This is confession time. We'll just go yeah. around. We'll start with <laughs> Dave, and then, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But one thing would be to tell other people. Yeah. I have found um, upstairs Advent books, I think, that our church has given out. Have they done that? I don't know where I've gotten these three Advent in their different years. So maybe be more intentional in an Advent devotion. That focuses. I mean, that's an idea. We dug out um, last year in the Little Free Library. We gave out Advent coloring book for families, and but you know it came at the end, so we just dug it out and started it tonight. And I think it's a Advent's just a good like, hey, for this time, let's let's do this practice and you know, take something on. Well, I think how much. I've already done getting ready for Christmas and Christmas presents and thinking about um, scheduling when we're going to see people and all that. I think, well, if I compare how much we've done comparably getting ready for celebrating Jesus, it's probably not an even balance. Well, John said the man who has two tunics should share with the one who has none. I have I a lot of tunics. Well, no, I don't have any tunic, <laughs> but I have a lot of code. And uh, I, I think that we're used to, um, I think we're used to a prosperous lifestyle and that we don't, we don't adhere to that the way he seems to say we should. They say if you have two coats, you stole one from the poor. Well, what if you have three? Is that they they specifically he says two. So if you have three and the one and a half, just make sure you're above that two. <laughs> Any other Third questions question. around? So is there another question? There? Another question. Okay. How will you prepare the way for Jesus in your life? It was interesting to me that John the Baptist is telling everybody to prepare for the way, but he doesn't really know Jesus. I mean, he was his cousin, but he doesn't mm -hmm. really know that that's the Messiah. And 
Um, so he's preparing, but he doesn't exactly know what he's preparing for. Yeah, it's an interesting, you know, the word of the Lord came to him and he went out and preached this, but yeah, he wasn't exactly sure even um, when or how that was going to happen. And even when Jesus was there, it's, are you the one or is it somebody else? Just sweet. Again, I, I'm become convinced that John was expecting Jesus to to preach a gospel of judgment, and um, in that when Jesus didn't, that that was that was what John was confused about. That you know, hey, hey I baptized you. I thought you were gonna kind of follow. You know, he especially in Luke has such harsh words for the crowds, and then Jesus comes healing and um, all this, and so I, I think. Again, G John sort of conflated what really would be two comings of Jesus into one. Um, and I'd be curious, I sort of was making that case last week. I don't, we'd love to have more time to think in, around this. Like, what was the one, like the two at once predicted by the prophets, and did God spare humanity or? You know, do we see evidence that it was always going to be a twofold? I don't, I don't know. But... Do you think John the Baptist he heard all the stories about how he jumped in his mother's womb and and that Jesus was was the Messiah? Do you think they talked about that in their families? Or I would have to assume so that he would know just kind of set apartness of and. Partly why, again, at the end of chapter one, he, he moved into the wilderness as a young man yet um, to prepare himself for this. Um, so I, I would guess he knew those stories. Mm -hmm. What's next anything? week? Uh, next week is the um, John in prison and uh, asking Jesus if he is the one who is to come. So that expectations okay. of Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And then the um, okay. lessons of carols and then the beheading and the birth on Christmas Eve. So John was in prison after he had baptized Jesus. He had had. Are you going to talk about the baptism you said of Jesus? Um. Oh, not directly, no. I think we'll kind of jump right to the imprisonment part of Acts 7. Because one question would be, well, did he see the dove? Did he hear the voice from heaven? And if, if all of those happened, how could he even question whether this was, whether, you know, are you, this, are you the Jesus? I mean, that's pretty phenomenal what happened there. Yeah. But you don't yeah, have to answer that tonight. Oh, thanks. I have a whole week to figure that out. Good. All right. Well, I'll turn off the recording, and then we'll go move on to prayer.